Hi everyone, my name is Tomás de Luqui from Purdue University and thank you for listening to my presentation today. The work I'll be presenting is part of my master's project and the title for this presentation is How does wheat density impact herbicide efficacy? As most of you know, there are several factors affecting foliar herbicide efficacy and one of them is wheat density, which will be the focus of this presentation today. Scientific literature says that higher wheat densities make post-emergence herbicide failure more likely, and one of the reasons for this can be overlapping of leaves, causing insufficient spray deposition on all plants. Also, plants growing in competition may not have enough leaf area to intercept the herbicide so it can effectively move through the canopy. An inverse relationship between wheat density and efficacy of wheat management programs has been demonstrated and is thought to be because of less spray coverage or deposition. Plants that normally grow in unshaded or lightly shaded habitats can distinguish differences in the proximity of other plants through alterations in the spectral intensity of light. They can respond to such differences in the ratio of red to far red light, detecting them with a family of plant photoreceptors called the phytochromes. A low red to far red ratio induces what is called shade avoidance syndrome responses that occur at plant level and influence the whole plant morphology, including increased stem length and assimilate partitioning to, um, towards the stem instead of leaves and branches. So a low red to far red ratio increases apical dominance and reduces basal branching. When referring to regrowth potential in the case of an unsatisfactory post herbicide application, it is expressed as compensatory growth from axillary buds. This is particularly important when spraying non systemic herbicides, since they kill the upper portion of the plant, breaking um, apical dominance and releasing previously dormant axillary buds. Within the group of plants that exhibit high regrowth potential, we can count tall water hemp. Germination throughout the season and its rapid um, growth rate make management of these species very complex. And to make matters worse, evolved herbicide resistance to multiple modes of action exacerbates um, the problem. Glufosinate and oxynic herbicides are currently the only two options for post immersion control of tall water hemp in resistant soybeans. So considering all this information, we proposed two hypotheses. The first one was that tall water hemp plants growing in high density will intercept less herbicide spray than plants growing in low density. And the second one was that the influence of reduced spray interception in high density will have similar effect in systemic and non-systemic herbicides. To test this hypothesis, we developed two objectives. Quantify spray deposition and herbicide efficacy on tall water hemp growing in low and high densities. And determine if tall water hemp response is different for a non systemic herbicide, in this case, clofacinate, versus a systemic herbicide, in this case, dicamba. During 2020, we conducted two separate water hemp trials in two different counties of Indiana, Tippecanoe and Randolph. Trials utilized a two-factor factorial randomized complete block design with four replications and three by seven meter plots, and the two factors were wheat density and herbicide. Wheat densities were low density, high density but thinned right before spraying, and high density. And the herbicide sprayed included glufosinate and dicamba at the rates shown in the table. Weeds were between 10 and 15 centimeters in height when herbicides were sprayed, and all the applications were made using standard small plot research techniques. We used XR802 nozzles for glufosinate and TT11002 nozzles for dicamba, and both were sprayed with a CO2 pressured backpack sprayer and uh, using a carrier volume of 140 liters per hectare. As stated in the previous slide, we simulated three different densities in the field. Plants growing in low density, we cleaned about one foot of the perimeter around individual plants by hand when these were between three and five centimeter seedlings, so around one or two inches. 
allowing them to grow isolated until they reached between 10 and 15 centimeters because that's when herbicides were sprayed. For the second situation, or a type of density if you will, plants were growing in high density plots but within one foot of the perimeter around them right before spraying to avoid any type of interference or leaf overlapping. In the third case, the plants selected for the experiment were growing in plots with high width density throughout the entire trial and they were competing against each other and with a lot of leaf overlapping. As you can see in the low density plots, plants were branched and with more leaf area. In the thin plots, plants had thinner stems, hardly any branches and less leaf area. And in the high density plots, plants look exactly like the, like the ones in the thin plots, but we had the interference and overlapping factor. So all the biological and physiological responses we mentioned at the beginning became evident in these three situations. Three plants were marked in each plot for evaluation of spray solution deposition at application, and pictures were taken to quantify green area using ImageJ software. Five extra plants were marked in each plot for evaluation at 0, 7, 14, and 21 days after application of control percentage, plant height, number of branches, whether the apical meristem was dead or alive, and biomass collected 21 days after application. There were also three chrome coat cards per plot for droplet density and coverage analysis. The spray bottles contained the herbicide, the corresponding adjuvant in the case of glufosinate, vision pink foam marker dye for the chrome coat cards, which actually ended up t turning the entire bottle pink, and finally the spectrotrace fluorescent dye for the spray deposition analysis. For the total spray solution deposition on target wheat plants using PTSA dye, the three plants marked in each plot were carefully harvested and placed in the containers with the rinse solution for a total of 30 seconds, and all the containers with the rinse solution for each plant were brought back to the lab and analyzed with the fluorometer for raw fluorescence. Once the wash-off process was completed, plants were kept in paper bags, brought back to the lab, and all the leaves were cut and run through the leaf area meter. With those values and through a series of calculations, we obtained the results for spray solution deposition in microliters per centimeter squared of leaf. Given the limited amount of time we have today, I will be presenting just the results for the spray solution deposition, along with results for biomass collected 21 days after application. The statistical analysis was ANOVA using ProcLimix in SAS 9.4. and Differences in means were separated using Tukey's HSD with an alpha of 0.05. And now I will transition to the results section. This first graph shows the results for spray solution deposition. On the x-axis we have the three different densities, and on the y-axis we have the spray solution deposition in microliters per centimeter squared. Tall water hemp density was the only significant factor, and as you can see here, the amount of spray solution deposited on plants growing in low density and thin density was similar and greater than the spray solution deposited on plants growing in high density. This can be attributed to the overlapping and foliage interference that prevented the spray solution from reaching the target weeds. Remember that even though plants in the low density plots were larger, we're accounting for the difference in leaf area. This next graph shows the results for tall water hemp biomass collected 21 days after treatment for glufosinate. On the x-axis, we have the three different tall water hemp densities once again, and on the y-axis, we have the biomass calculated as a percentage of the non-treated. So lower values mean greater herbicide activity. So despite the differences in coverage, we didn't see differences in biomass for low and high densities, but we did see a significant decrease in the biomass for the low density plots when compared to the thin ones. Now, if you remember the previous slide, spray deposition was the same for the low and thin densities, 
but the difference was that for the plants in the low density plots, growth of axillary buds was already occurring. So branching and the bigger leaves were a potential location for herbicide deposition. Plants in the thin plots still had the potential to regrow from axillary buds, so that process started once apical dominance was lost because of the contact herbicide. And that's why we saw a significant decrease in the biomass for the low density plots when compared to the thinned ones. And these photos illustrate that difference in biomass for the three weed densities. Now moving on to results for tall water hemp biomass collected 21 days after treatment, but for dicamba, in this case, the graph is set up in the same way. On the x-axis, we have the three different tall water hemp densities. And on the y-axis, we have the biomass calculated as a percentage of the non-treated. In this case, efficacy results for dicamba were different from the ones for clofacinate. Greater dicamba efficacy was observed in the high density plots compared to the thinned plots. To review, spray deposition was greater in the thin plants compared to the high density plants. So this result in which we saw greater dicamba efficacy in the high density plots compared to the thin ones was the opposite to what we anticipated. These photos from the field trials illustrate the biomass differences for the three weed densities 21 days after the application. And although it's kind of hard to visualize from these photos, but we saw greater efficacy in the high density plots. So in summary, the amount of herbicide intercepted by weeds growing in the high density plots was less than the amount of herbicide intercepted in the other two situations. Efficacy of the non-systemic herbicide clofosinate was influenced by apical dominance or the extent of lateral branching and the efficacy of the systemic herbicide dicamba was influenced by spray deposition, but the opposite of expectations. This research suggests that weed density is a factor that needs to be considered when implementing any post-emergence herbicide application. Spray deposition, apical dominance, and the extent of lateral branching may all be involved in determining herbicide efficacy in foliar applications. And the extent that these results pertain to other herbicides, weed species, and environmental conditions remains uncertain. For future research, we will conduct the same experiment in the greenhouse under control conditions, but with the three different weed densities to make sure that the results, um, especially for dicamba, are consistent. And we will also evaluate weed regrowth, development, and herbicide efficacy under varying soil moistures. I would like to thank everybody at Purdue who participated in this research with me, and I will be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you.